have that we don't have. And God has the ability to apprehend the true nature of a situation or a person. The true nature. You see, it's easy to look at people on the outside, but God sees them on the inside. What do you say? And that's why we have to be careful sometimes looking at a person from the exterior and concluding that they don't know God. The exterior doesn't tell the entire story. Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. But God also has foresight, the ability to look forward and make provision for what is coming. Isaiah says it this way, Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. God's insight and foresight is so perfect that God saw through 42 generations and decided whom to choose as the husband of Mary to whom Jesus was born. I looked at that story and I was enamored by that. This morning, as a matter of fact, I preached to my mother-in-law and my wife. So this sermon has been preached already. I went to bed about 3.15 this morning. I'm not tired. The joy of the Lord is my strength. What do you say? I'll sleep later. But it's nothing like sitting down and becoming a conduit Letting God pour into you. My fingers were moving so fast, I said to my wife, I couldn't slow down. The problem was I had to decide what to leave out and what to include. I said, God filtered this message. But I began to look at that and I began to see that for 42 generations, God decided who the man was going to be that was going to be the one to impact the baby Jesus when he was born. He chose a man by the name of Joseph. And the Bible says in Matthew 1 and verse 17, follow me carefully. This is the David Asherick speed. Here you go. You ready? So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. The family line of Jesus may look like God made a mistake, but God never makes a mistake. God can make a good thing out of an ugly thing. What do you say? Now think about the family line of Jesus for a brief moment. David the adulterer and the murderer. Rahab the harlot. Solomon the polygamist. And Uzziah the leper. Just to name a few. God went through that kind of family line. And 42 generations later found a man that he was able to label as a just man. Is that God? Only God can bring a just man through an adulterer, a murderer, a harlot, a polygamist, and a leper. So brethren, if somebody in your family is not behaving right, God can make a good thing out of a bad thing. Your life, if God can do that, it may take 42 generations, but something good is going to come out of that. God, time is no issue with God. I looked at my family line. I thought to myself, Lord, you can do that? And I found the family line text. I finally understood the impact of this text because in the family line of Jesus, for every one of them to be saved, God had to find a way to cover their sin. To blot their sin out. Can you say amen? Isaiah, here it is. The family line text. And when you hear the phrase our or we, fit your family in there. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Somebody say amen. The family, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the sins of the family. What do you say? Amen. When the Lord went to the cross, he took his family's sins with him. And now a harlot can be in the kingdom. What do you say? Amen. Solomon can be there. David can be there. A man that is now known as a man after God's own heart. Only God can make a good thing out of a bad thing. God can turn miracles. I look at my family line and I think about how, how my family line came together. You know, somebody once said to me, I'm the product of a one-night stand. My mom and dad got together long enough to conceive me. They didn't have a wedding certificate. Matter of fact, maybe just, they just probably had one good evening together. And I want you to pause for a brief moment because you know what? I don't believe that I'm the product of a one-night stand. I believe I'm the product of a divine stand. Follow me carefully. A Filipino grandfather. A European French grandmother. A Native American grandfather on my father's side. A Native American, uh, uh, an African American grandmother on my father's side. Four nations all together. A baby born out of wedlock, but in God's plan. You didn't hear what I said. 
how I was born is not as important as that I was born. Somebody once said, children are not Ill illegitimate, the parents are. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? Yes. They are the one that made the decision to do it wrong, but birth is a blessing from God. Yes. Mother takes me to a babysitter and drops me there, but she drops me at the home of a Seventh-day Adventist lady who has a connection with God. What do you say? Yes. Is that an accident or a divine plan? But her husband's not married, so there's a struggle in that household. And God leads me through a woman like Rebecca, what it means to serve and know and trust the Lord. So when she dies and I go away, God sends another Christian in my life, a 16-year-old Seventh-day Adventist young lady, to pull me out of the world and back into the church. And I'm married to her still today, 27 years. Can you say amen? amen. I'm not here by an accident. I'm here by a divine plan. So when your life looks like it's a mess, God could do a whole lot with a mess. By the way, if you don't know it or not, I'll remind you Sabbath afternoon, but every one of us started out that way anyway. We're all just a pile of dust with power from God inside of us. God can do a whole lot through messed up families. God can bring a beautiful thing out of an ugly situation. And God sees us as we are, but he also sees us as we can be. And sometimes, and go back to the story, sometimes though, here's the caution, sometimes our inherent weaknesses could be the stepping stone to robbing us of a divinely ordained blessing. Get that very carefully. I'll say that again. Sometimes our inherent weaknesses can be the stumbling block to robbing us of our divinely ordained blessing. Look at verse 29. And I'll preface this by saying, when you're not alert, somebody may be cooking up a scheme. <laughs> now Jacob cooked a stew. And Esau came in from the field and he was weary. I read this in Patriarchs and Prophets. I read this in the Bible commentary, and I sat down and put all these notes together weeks ago, and I let that thing simmer in my mind, and I said last night, okay, Lord, you know what's there. If it ain't there yet, put it there. And I discovered this. The request that Esau made was lazy and complacent. Notice what he said in verse 30. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. Ellen White says, in a matter of minutes, Esau could have cooked something for himself and saved himself a lifetime of heartache. Esau could have cooked his own meal. So he wasn't just tired. He was lazy. He was complacent. He benefited from somebody else's labor. He saw what Jacob had done and said, go ahead and you cook for me. But what he did not know was Jacob was cooking something other than what he saw. <laughs> and thus I say again, when you are lazy, somebody's cooking up something that you won't realize until years down the road. It may be a simple meal to you, but to them it's something far greater than that simple meal. He didn't see what the moment brought. Notice verse 31 and 32. And by the way, as I read this, remember this point. Lazy people are an easy prey to opportunistic people. There is no such thing as getting something for nothing. Everything has a price. Look at verse 31 and 32. But Jacob said, here's the price. Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die, and so what is this birthright to me anyway? He understood in the Levitical law, in the Mosaic law, that the birthright was a birthright of magnificent blessings. A double portion of his father's inheritance. Respect and prosperity. He wanted the position, but he did not want the spiritual responsibility that went with the position. There's some people that want to be leaders in the church, but it takes a spiritual person to be a leader. Can you say amen? amen. 
There's some people that want to be the head of this and the head of that, but if God is not the head of their lives, the head of that is not going to do anything for them at all. <laughs> Matter of fact, to be a leader without God, you're not really a leader. You're a hindrance to God leading. He wanted the position, but he did not want the spiritual responsibility that went with the position of the birthright. And that's why the Bible says he despised his birthright. He despised the very thing that God intended to give to him. That's why, brethren, when people give you things, let me pause and digress for a brief moment here. This is a different term, but I'm coming back. When people get generous, you have to weigh their generosity. Because if they are not converted, you could be selling your soul. Just like Esau sold his soul to Jacob. You got to make sure Jacob was not converted. And although he was not entirely like his grandfather Abraham, he displayed the same impatient spirit that Abraham did. Remember the story? God said he was going to bless Abraham and Sarah. And Abraham, to this very day, I wonder why he was, how he was. But by his time, polygamy had been introduced, so he thought it no great thing to have a baby with one woman after the other in the attempt to help God fulfill his promise. And Rebekah, understanding God's plan, the angel before they were born said to Rebekah that Jacob, the younger one, he will be the one that will be served by Esau, the older one. And so Jacob decided that this was his moment. This was his opportunity. Let me make it very clear. God does not need our help to help us. We don't need to help God to bless us. By the way, you'll discover in the story, a premature blessing can turn out to be a curse. If it comes before you're ready for it, it can be the very reason why you fall. Notice, I'll read verse 31 in just a moment, or verse 33, but I want to just stop and pause and talk to the parents for a brief moment, because you know what? I was raised in a home where my mother knew that I was too immature and too experienced to make certain decisions. There are parents today that give their children the power to make decisions that they are too immature and too inexperienced to decide. Now, now this would never happen in my household. You want to go to church on Sabbath? You didn't get me. My mother on Sabbath morning would never say to me, do you want to go to church or do you want to stay home? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. When Sabbath came, whether my clothes were ironed or not, I was in church. As a matter of fact, when the sun was setting on Friday, she said, now get your clothes ironed and hang them up right there. Because Sabbath morning, if you are not dead, you'll be in church. <laughs> you'll be coughing and sniffling in the corner, but you'll be in church. There were no excuses on Sabbath morning. And I think that one of the problems today in our world is that somehow parents have failed in their responsibility to raise their children. The Bible says train up a child in the way that they should go. Nowadays, kids have a, you know, they, they go to, they, in their house like a menu. I'd like to go to church today, but not next Sabbath. I'd like to watch this. I want that game and this movie and I want this out outfit. And I've seen parents buy some of the skimpiest outfits for their daughters and complain about the daughters wearing it. <laughs> Look at her, Pastor. She don't like And I said, now, wait a minute. Who's the mother? Who bought that outfit for her? I did. Now, you complain about what she's wearing, but you're buying it for her? Well, and I, I, I was in Australia. I did a seminar on jewelry. I don't want to get off on that right now. But a mother asked me, Elder Brooks, a mother asked me, questions and answers after I laid the whole thing out. She said, now what do you do when your three-year-old daughter wants her ears pierced? I almost jumped out of my shoes. And so I just made it straight. I said, now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're the mother, not her. Let her cry. She'll stop and fall asleep and go to bed, but you say no and stand there. Somebody say amen. amen. Nowadays, we got kids making all the choices for parents, and they wonder, now what's going on? What's wrong with the family? And then they look back with regret at decisions that they made that were uninformed and without thought of the long-term impact. So nowadays, the children left the church, and you can trace it back. A lot of times, you can trace it back to a decision that the father or mother made. And if you don't know what children will play you, if you want to be foolish, children will play you. That's why the best answer, moms and dads, if you haven't figured it out yet, if your child comes to you and say, Mom, I want to do this, say, what'd your daddy say? 
Good. What's your mind?